Hey, it's the Creative Nonfiction Podcast, where I speak with the world's best writers, freelancers, interviewers, authors, and documentary filmmakers about why and how they go about creating works of nonfiction and how you can apply what they do to your work. Today's guest is Joe Ferraro, the fourth Joe I've had on the podcast. There was Joe DiPaolo, Joe Drape, Joe Donahue, and now Joe Ferraro. You to Josephine. Anyway, so who's Joe Ferraro? He's a teacher and a learner, but above all, he's a leader. He just started a podcast, the 1% Better Podcast, and his tagline is Conversations Designed to Help You Get 1% Better. It's aimed at gradual, continual, rigorous, though not overwhelming, personal improvement. For instance, my desk right now is a total incomplete cluster. I will feel like it's a 1% better improvement to clean my desk today, assign things their place, and keep it that way. Maybe taking the time to chew your food more or floss is a 1% improvement that will make you 100% better three times a year. And who wouldn't buy that stock, right? Joe talks about his allergy for negative people, finding ways to challenge himself, and how after teaching for 20 years, he feels like his best years are still ahead of him. He's the type of guy that inspires you to take action, which makes him a great coach and teacher and, like I said, a leader. So be sure to follow Joe on Twitter and reach out to him. He's very active, and he's not going to big-time anybody. His Twitter handle is at Ferraro on air. That's F-E-R-R-A-R-O on air, all one word. Reach out, like I said, and then subscribe to his podcast right away. Whether it's listening to world-class leader Ryan Hawk how to make the best cold brew coffee, the art of thinking, or redefining a restaurant, the 1% Better podcast will open your eyes to where you can add value to your life, and as a result, those around you. Anyone know something else? He's got a voice made for broadcasting, so just sit back and enjoy episode 58 with Joe Ferraro, host of the 1% Better podcast. Thanks for listening. This, this, your one percent better concept is it's this continual improvement, continual learning, and it's like a like a, a master course in Habit Seven of Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. You know, it's that constant. All right, what can I do to get a little bit, a little bit better? And that slow accumulation uh, adds up to mastery over time. And I wanted to ask you first, like, how did you come to that idea? It's the true idea of, of it feels like, oh, overnight it just came to me. And then when I look back and try to think of the origin story, it, it's, it's found in everything I've been doing for 20 years, right? So when I started coaching, I would, I would turn to my assistant coaches and I'd say, all right, today's the day. And then he would just be like, what does that mean? <laughs> and I'd be like, today's the day. Like something great's going to happen today. Today's the day we, we get better. Today's the day we take one step forward. Something special is going to happen today. Something special is going to happen today. And then as you keep going and you try to figure out like who you are, who you want to be, um, and it's taken a long time to get to this, this clarity of it where it's literally just let's get a little better when we go to bed tonight than we were when we woke up. I think it's it's so pervasive now in the culture that you can actually look at it where it's it almost becomes something I cringe at where is it too commercialized? And then I immediately just kind of slap myself and say, no, no, this is just this is a title to focus me. This is something that, you know, the name is a little bit overrated, I found in, in the whole creative process. Um, it's much, much more about starting and actually doing the work. And I guess to answer your question, I truly try to live in a way where if I dive into something, I'm diving in deep. I'm not trying to dive in and, and touch the surface. I'm trying to find out all about it. And then the moment we, we find out or I find out that I'm not interested as I was or I'm not as obsessed with it as I thought I might be, uh, it's on to something else. So when I think about getting 1% better, it's part of that idea. And then the other part of it is it's, it's so manageable. Like you can't look someone in the eye and say, I couldn't get 1% better today. And, uh, and, and for that, it really helps. And obviously, you know, uh, Covey, I think of his work, but I also think of Darren Hardy and the compound effect. I think of James Clear. Um, I'm not one of these guys that that 
and I don't think many people are actually in the creative world, people that would listen to your podcast, we steal from everybody. We, we, mm -hmm. we, we borrow, we steal. You got Austin Cleon, you know, ringing in my head. And, you know, it's, it's not that we're trying to take someone's concept. It's that the way I look at it, every single thing that you've read, person that you've met and, and podcasts that you've listened to have kind of led you to this moment. And that's kind of where I'm at. Where does that come from? It, what kind of, you know, what kind of kid were you where maybe this kernel started? Or maybe it's something that completely developed as you grew into a young adult. No, I, it, it's definitely young. And uh, when I'm in front of my classroom, I often reveal a lot of myself to the students to, to let them know I'm in the journey with them. So a lot of times I'll say, I must have been a nerdy kid. And they'll believe it because I'm constantly quoting Seth Godin and I'm constantly talking about uh, things in the media that, they, that are creative and inspiring and fill the tank. So they're like, they don't have to go far to see that I, I was a nerd. Hmm. But, but I, I think that the story would tell it a little differently because I was playing three sports for a long time. Um, then in high school, I really began to focus on uh, a baseball but the whole time, you know, growing up, I was the kid playing football. I was the kid in basketball. I was the kid in baseball. All three just kind of that, that true stereotypical, let's go play stickball. Let's go play wiffle ball. Let's go play CYO basketball all the way through. So when I start thinking back, I, I think it's something that it's weird that I consider myself kind of a, a nerd in that sense when I was doing the athlete thing as well. But I do recall conversations with my dad watching a baseball game. And, and, and where I started this, this kind of convoluted story was in going to, the, to, to be on your podcast, I get to think about the origin story. Mm -hmm. And when I would sit in front of the TV watching a baseball game to my, with my dad, I would often ask him questions. And that's a familiar story. But when I look back on my, my version of that story, I would ask him what seemed to be ridiculous questions. I would ask him things like, and this is a true story, what happens if on a throw down the second – the shortstop tags the runner sliding in. The ball flies out of his glove. And he would say, well, that's, that's, he's safe. I said, yeah, but what if when he slaps the ball out, the second baseman catches the ball in the air? Is that still a mess? Because that ball never touched the ground. And I, it's a great uh, moment in parenting to think about it now as a parent. Like, that's a crazy question that doesn't make a lot of sense. But those are the things that I would be thinking about. Because the, once I, I learned the rules of the game, I'm actually now trying to get into the nuance of the game. So it's not so much why did he do that? It was actually another layer. It was like, well, what would happen if instead of doing that, he did this? And I, and I still carry that with me to, to this day. So I, I found out somewhere along the line that if I was in a comfortable space, and that's a key for me, um, where I felt that the person was listening to me and would answer my questions with, with dignity, uh, I just, there was no question I wouldn't ask. So I kind of just took that. Again, if I'm getting the signals from someone that they're not, going to be uh, okay with making me vulnerable, they're not going to be, you know, make it a safe place, um, then I'm going to shut down the questions and I'm pretty good at reading body language. So uh, I think that is something that I bring into my teaching to try to create that environment in the classroom. Who else? It sounds like your your dad was a pretty formative influence on you. Um, what, uh, who, like, including your dad, like, who else would you cite as someone you could go to with those questions and would give you that positive body language to say, yes, Joe, keep going? Yeah. Well, it's funny. My dad was um, 100 percent a lead by example guy um, in thinking about my dad. And, you know, we talk quite a bit, but it's a very one sided conversation. So as I think about it, he was the listener. He was not creating any kind of um, dialogue, so to speak. He was just a stereotypical old school. I don't want to say Italian because he's an Italian American, but, you know, and he, he's a second generation here. Um, but he was just listening. He was a rock. He was going to work every day at his restaurant. That was what he gave me. Mom was in the trenches, right? Mom was uh, doing the project with me, making sure Thomas Edison was spelled correctly in the project there that in fourth grade. And he, she was the one doing all that stuff. Um, what I did remember, though, about that was that he never said a discouraging word. So he was never that is an amazing idea guy. He was never that guy. But he would very, very understatedly say, you can do anything you want if you put your mind to it, but you got to work. And that would be like his message, but he wouldn't say it. Like he would say that once a year. And I think when we retell our story, sometimes we paint our parents as a picture of like, oh, he must have been just like rah, rah behind your back. No, he was just you know, that was what he would say once a month, once a year. And you would take it uh, to take your question. another step, though, in terms of mentors, um, you know, I had a little league coach. 
who worked on trick plays with us, who taught us how to appeal, who had the most boring practice you could ever imagine that involved hitting a ball off a tee with a rope attached to it, hitting a tire swing, doing wrist throws, then forearm, then full throws. Every other league team did nothing like that. So I think that was formative. But then overall, in terms of who do I think are mentors, it's so funny. I think I've been collecting more mentors in the last 10 years of my life than I did in the, in the first 20. Mm. It's, it's, it's just something that, uh, in thinking about it, it's almost like that Goodwill hunting moment where he has mentors of, of uh, books and authors that are no longer alive, but I seem to hone in on the ones that are still alive so I can interact with them. You know, you and I talked about this. The new media allows you to hear a Seth Godin message and then reach out to him, to hear Brian Koppelman speaking and reach out to him, and, and quite, quite honestly, to hear your message and reach out to you and vice versa. So we, we kind of met that way. And it's, it's no exaggeration to say that, that mentors have appeared to me more in the last decade than they had in the first 20. It's, it, and especially when you're sort of on, like when you're on a, this this type of you know broadcasting media as, as well it's like you see someone you admire and you're never you're almost never more than an email or a tweet away and then if you're lucky and you can kind of like sell your idea you can actually kind of get these people on the phone or and record it and offer them offer them something i can offer you some extra airwaves to kind of help promote your work and shine a light on your work and we can kind of pick each other's well i can pick your brain and it's going to help other people. It's going to promote your work. And then, you know, everyone, everyone wins. And that sort of democratization of media and the way we're able to connect is just so, it's so valuable. And you can, you can get these people and consider them mentors, even if you don't necessarily see them face to face. There's no doubt about it. I, I absolutely love that. And then bringing it into the classroom, it's, it's kind of amazing to me. Um, my students don't think about that, that as a pathway. They don't think, let me read a book or article and write to the author. And, and maybe it's, as I'm saying that, maybe of course they don't think that. They're 17 years old. They have other things on their mind. But that's something I actually do try to tell them because there's very few 17-year-olds that are doing it, right? There's, there's quite a bit more 39-year-olds doing it. And, and they don't realize, and I try to tell them, you can really differentiate yourself before even entering college by, by learning from people that are still creating. And that's kind of what I try to model for them, right? I'm, I'm the writer in the room with them. I'm, I'm doing some projects with them, but you're, you're exactly right. You know, there, there's nothing more short answer the, my mentors are, are people that are working and creating now, whether they know it or not. And just with my new projects, um, it allows me to get in touch with them. So, you, you know, your dad worked in, the, worked in the restaurant business. I, I'm obsessed with food and chefs and, and the, mm the art that goes into that and, and the rigor it takes. And what did, what did your dad being in the restaurant business teach you about rigor? Work ethic. Absolutely unequivocal work ethic. I recently had a colleague, um, friend and a colleague say, you know, you, you just don't take, you don't take any sick days. And <laughs> I could hear my dad. I mean, he never, again, he never said, Joe, don't take any sick days. He just never took a sick day. Now it's his own business. But you know what? There's ways around that. You know, you can call it. People that own their own businesses don't go there every day. His work ethic, it was unbelievable. I mean, he's – I'm sure as we're recording, he's in the restaurant. I mean, he's not um, owner. He's owner, chef, dishwasher. You know, he realized that the margins in the restaurant business come when you don't hire a chef. So it's funny. When I hear other businesses opening up, he taught me this once. He said, you know, you, you have an idea if a restaurant is going to succeed or fail – based on how many different chefs they hire. So if you, uh, I have a sous chef, I have a dessert chef, I have this, I have a master of cuisine, the restaurant's in serious trouble. Now, when you're talking about Manhattan or some of the metropolitan areas, you're at a scale where you have to hire that kind of staff. But if you're opening a family type restaurant um, and you have multiple employees doing the work, you have a lot of people sharing profits and it doesn't work. So I, I think my dad was just meticulous with um, organization and, um, and a very, very steadfast work ethic. And it's just, it, it's amazing. I mean, it, it trickles over. I mean, he never put it on a card. He never said, be like this. He just did it. And bringing up work ethic, it's, it's always something that's a little, a little abstract. I, I think like, you know, you're a baseball guy, you know, we, 
both played, I think, fairly competitive ball throughout most of our lives. And I know what hard work looks like when I'm when I'm training for ball. Like when I go went down into my basement, I had the Tony Gwynn indoor solo hitter. And yes. Do you remember that thing? Oh my God! Yeah, of course. I, you know, I was down on that thing. You know, five hundred swings every single night. As a result, I almost never struck out, even though I was kind of a power hitter for mm. for in high school. You know, I just I never swung at a bad pitch, and if I I just always was able to put the bat on the ball, and it was because I spent so much time, and I also just spent hours in front of a wall throwing a ball up against it and fielding the ground ball, giving myself short hops everything like that just on, on my knees just working on you know a, a nice supple wrist flick to get the ball into my glove hand up to my throwing hand quick and and so forth i know what hard work looks like for a baseball player when you're in the creative world it can get a bit it's like what does hard work look like so i would say that to you as as a teacher and you know podcaster and creator how do you define hard work and tenacity and rigor and what you do and how do you measure that so you can constantly you know kind of sharpen that saw what a great question and and i gotta say that a lot of people you'll come across will, will say things like it's hard to define a, a certain word and then that's the end of the conversation <laughs> to me to me that's the beginning of the conversation there are age-old words that people hide behind saying i don't know how to define it I can't give you a perfect definition of it, but you, I think of two things when, and when I define that one is reps, right? You just, you described it with, with the Tony Gwynn, you know, rest in peace, Tony. But (laughs) you, you, you said, um, you said reps, you had more reps than the person next to you. So that can transfer very easily into the creative world, right? How many words per day? Uh, how many pages per day? How many hours per day? What we're learning with this beautiful, you know, sharing that goes on on the internet is that it doesn't matter if you go by word count and I go by page count and then someone next to me goes by hour count. It matters that you do one of those three things every day. And so that's the reps part of it. That's that's what hard work looks like, you know, exhibit A. Exhibit B to me is squeezing more out of a day than someone else. And mm-hmm. I, I hate to make it sound like it's a comparative game, but on some level, right, if you're talking about hard work, you, you are you are comparing yourself to other people. So what I would say is, Nothing upsets me more. Well, very few things upset me more than when someone says I'm, I'm too busy. Mm-hmm. It's just it's amazing that that somehow that person thinks they're more busy than you. Every single person has the exact same amount of time and how you or I are going to squeeze more out of it than the next person is, is really it. Now, there's a lot to be said for slowing down. I love a lot of quotes about, you know, Gandhi says there's more to life than increasing its speed. I mean, what a beautiful quote. But if we're talking about hard work, um, it's, it's about squeezing out more in the day. Last thought on that, uh, my uncle is a painter, and I hope to have him on my show soon. But he kind of scoffed at the idea of hard work in, in terms of art. And, I, and I, I said, well, but aren't you painting every day? He said, yeah, but I'm not in a coal mine. Mm-hmm. You know, this is, this is painting. And, and, and at first I thought he was reducing it. I thought he was saying, well, it's, it's, it's easy. But what he really meant was, there's nothing hard. About, there's nothing hard about it. It's difficult to be great. It's it's hard to be to be great at it. But it's just it's I guess it's another word, right? It's consistency. So I guess kind of summing that up, I would say you got to have more reps than you think you need. And someone should announce that. Right. So when someone says, oh, how many pages did you write? It's not a comparative game in terms of bragging. It's just you have to have some idea. Is that a lot? Um, squeezing out more in the day. And then thirdly, you know, just realizing that at the end of the day, it doesn't have to feel like it's tedious. Yeah, and it, the going to your point about people, you know, being maybe too busy, usually that's that's an excuse for not prioritizing time. Choices, okay. yeah, poor choices. Yeah. And and I it's funny, like I wasn't, you know, just going using that baseball example, like I wasn't a supremely gifted player, but at the at the high school and like you know, whatever that level you know, putting in those reps in that time made me good at that level. And I think the same can be true if, you know, if you're willing to put in those reps, you can really take whatever maybe small kernel of talent you have and really, really expand it. But you do have to put in the work. Like it's, it's just, it does it just, it really does come down to those repetitions. But you also have to have like Dinty Moore, 
who I had on the podcast a few episodes ago. He's like, you really have to have patience. And and he's such a great writer. And it was so great to hear him articulate that, you know, like this isn't my first draft. This is my 43rd. And yeah. so there's a guy who's a master who takes 40 to 50 drafts to get something that is publishable, in his opinion. And it, that's eye-opening that you can go through that degree of repetition and repetition and repetition to reach something that is... Um, yeah, that is, that is beautiful. And that, and that's the work. Yeah. And you'll, you'll hear, you know, either apprentices or young learners, how did you get so good at that? And the answer almost always is practice and reps. Yeah. And there's one episode that you had with, with Kevin on KWB radio and it actually like put my ass in the chair. Like after nice, was, nice. Yeah. Like after I was walking my dogs, it was the end of a one conversation uh, you guys had it was like the final eight minutes. I forget the exact episode. It might be like thirty-seven or thirty-eight, right around there. And it was, it was right at the end. And Kevin went, uh, you know, in his very soft-spoken way, kind of went on a rant. And it was about, it was about hard work. Like you're at this level, and you think you think you're working hard, and then you get to the next level, and you realize you haven't been working hard at all. And uh, as I had come to realize that, like, that came from experience for him. And um, I, I was just like that put that put me back. It's just like, you have to constantly reevaluate what it is to be, what it is to be tenacious and redefine what hard work is at each level. Because now everyone has gotten to this level at a certain level and squeezed out every bit of their talent. So it's like, all right, what more can you do? And so many people do not take that next, that next step. Yeah. It's it. Kevin's statement is terrifying because it calls into question why you didn't get to a certain level. Baseball, it's super tangible, right? I mean, I, I played Division One college baseball, and then no one ever taps you on the shoulder like they say in the movies and says, kid, you're not good enough. It just becomes blatantly obvious. And uh, then you start looking back and you say, man, I, I, I didn't work hard enough. And that's where a little trouble can kind of swoop in is like enough is enough. That's that's tricky. That's a tricky balance. I don't have a, a beautiful formula, formula for that, but it's – it's amazing that there's so much more work to be done. I, I had a moment with this very recently. I had a, I had a conversation with Ryan Hawk, and uh, again, he wasn't giving advice, but he made it uh, acutely aware to me that he was outworking me. In a million years, he would never tell me that. That's what I deduced. Mm -hmm. But, but wow, I mean, he's he's someone I admire in the podcast game, and he gave me some of his habits, and I was silently shaking my head and taking notes saying, okay, it's back to work tomorrow. <laughs> it's back yeah. to work tomorrow, man. Oh my goodness. What did success look like to you when you were early twenties and in, in, into your thirties? Mm. I knew I wanted to do something that I would enjoy. Um, again, going back to the restaurant business, I did toast on Sunday mornings and, uh, in my dad's restaurant and he would get omelets freshly made before the toast would come out. And I have distinct visions of him flipping omelets in the air saying, see this, you don't want to do this every day. You don't want to do this, do something with this. And he would point to his temple and I'm like, okay. So that was the first sign point signpost. Cause there's so many people I've met throughout my life that have said, you don't want to go into the restaurant business. Do you know how easy that would be to just kind of go into a successful restaurant? And I laugh so hard. Do I know how easy it would be? It's, it's the opposite of what I want. Um, so I went out on my own on that regard. But then, you know, I'm going to be honest, I never wanted to go into something that was quote unquote risky or unsafe. So when I was thinking about coaching, that was something I really knew. When I was thinking about teaching, it was a little bit outside the box, but I was for me, but I was doing camps and I found myself more of a coach than a player at times. So again, it felt safe. Um, so I guess when I was a senior in uh, college, I started student teaching and my friends were, you know, doing what seniors do in college and I was student teaching. So there were definitely many, many weeknights where that was not an option for me. And before I graduated, I was fortunate enough to be offered two teaching jobs. Um, and that's not, that's not a humble brag. That's, I was searching for security. I was two hours away from home, which is not the end of the earth, but for me, it was outside my comfort zone. I still think my mom's waiting for me to come home. <laughs> she, she, you know, I, I went to Pace and it was two hours from Fairless Hills, Pennsylvania. And then I think she still thinks I'm going to teach in Pennsylvania. Um, so to have two job offers 
in New York felt secure. So that before I graduated, I had choices. Um, so I'm going to answer your question by saying um, something I loved, but also, Brendan, it had to be safe in some way. Um, that was my that was my 20s. You know, that was that was it. So so 20s uh, safe <laughs> and something I loved. Now, you're asking 30s. That's where it gets interesting, right? Because 10 years into the job, well, this year will be uh, year 19. And, uh, and as I said on a recent interview with someone, I said, I'm not a teacher that's getting burned out. I'm a teacher that's just starting to figure it out. So I really feel like I can't wait to have not year 19 be my best year. Um, and, I, and I feel like if we all – and again, you can hear that in my voice that that's, that's the 1% project, right? I mean it becomes a lifestyle. Um, the, the success though – the safety rather of the twenties did definitely went into the thirties. And then as I've gotten more comfortable at my job and I've realized that some of the things I do well, and I have some extra time to do some coaching and some writing and some podcasting, but, but you've seen it. It's only in the last few years that I've started to seek things that were outside my comfort zone. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's a process that I'm still living. So right now, um, I'm still trying to get comfortable being uncomfortable. I feel very comfortable sitting here talking to you. It's only recently I found out that I'm an introvert, which no one that, that meets me believes. Mm -hmm. But the reality is I love deep conversations. And I guess if I could say, you know, as I approach 40, what I want to do in terms of defining success for me is kind of merging all of my worlds into something so I can be doing one thing really well. And it seems to be teaching and learning. So I have the classroom teacher in one concentric circle, if you will. I have baseball coach in another. And I have the podcast uh, project in another. If I can merge all those and find that sweet spot where they all intersect, I know that I'm doing something that contributes. So that's the best way I can explain it. So how did you surround your – like to have this kind of mentality, you know, you, you have to keep the toxicity away. And so how do you go about surrounding yourself with the right kind of people that help support, you know, a, a positive mission of this of this nature? I try to do that with an allergy to negative people. It's, you know, I've once heard uh, coming from a place of yes. You know, I, I need to surround myself with people who come from a place of yes, maybe. I never thought about that. Let's give it a try. And again, it gets back to a supportive uh, environment. Um, it, it's just, you know what it is? It's a little bit of natural selection, right? You, you kind of go about your day. People observe your habits. If your skin can get thick enough, which I've been working on, to where people are going, you know people are going to say something behind your back like, oh, well, he's, he's doing that. He's not going out to lunch or no, he's, he's doing whatever, his podcast things. You've got to believe some of that goes on. And you just don't find people coming up to you unless they bring positive vibes. And then a lot of times you'll get that comment. It's like, oh, you know, Joe, you're so positive. Well, spend some more time with me. I mean, I, I don't know how else to say it. It's, it's weird when you talk about yourself as someone, I, I think people find it weird. You talk about yourself that has positive energy, but I refuse to admit that it's bragging to say I'm a positive person, right? That's, that's kind of what I'm doing on a daily basis. Students have, have made posters as kind of going away gifts for the classroom. And I, I think part of it is like they get to live immortally in the classroom. And part of it is just a true, genuine thoughtfulness. And it'll say, be an energy giver. You know, I didn't invent that. It's just something that kind of radiates or be where your feet are. These are signs in my classroom. And signs in my classroom have to be things that I can believe outside the classroom. So uh, I, don't, I don't know if I have a perfect practice, um, just, just more of a, uh, an allergy to people that, that aren't traveling the same way. Were you always such a, you know, an energy giver or was that something you cultivated over time? I like to think so. Um, but I definitely, uh, in, in, you know, I can't go this long into the interview without mentioning Kevin Wilson. He, he's become, uh, he's always been a friend, but he's become a, a true, true mentor. And I give a lot of my, my recent success and productivity to Kevin. He, he remembers a time when I was more grouchy. Uh, apt to complain, physically heavier, mentally heavier, a little bit of that darker, okay, I don't know what's going to happen next. Um, and I, t I still, Brendan, take things incredibly seriously. I'm not the guy that doesn't care what people think about me, mm -hmm. right? After this interview uh, goes to air, I would love people to reach out and say, hey, you know, this idea helped me. This idea, I didn't really get it. What did you mean by that? 
that's like the dream for me. I want feedback. I, I crave feedback. Um, so I, I think all of our memories could go, they stay either skew very negative to ourselves or they skew positive. I tend to remember just always being optimistic, even if outwardly uh, I was a little bit cautious and, and kind of heavy. How did you come to meet Kevin? Kevin was the hot shot freshman baseball player at Holy Ghost Prep. Mm -hmm. And here's an interesting parallel to what you just asked. I love how, how way leaves on to way into a conversation. Um, many, uh, I don't think Kevin would, would mind me sharing this. Many of my classmates, I was older than him, disliked Kevin. Why? Because he was a freshman, switch hitter, smooth fielding shortstop. <laughs> things <laughs> he was either gifted or things he cultivated in his own Tony Gwynn solo hitter type of basement way. <laughs> We did not like him. And I actually, let me just take myself out of that. They did not like him. He was a threat. He was the hot girl at the prom wearing that dress, even though she can rock it. And it's not her fault that we all hate it. And um, for some reason, I saw in him somebody as confident as Kevin is now. I saw in him some vulnerability. And I saw my friend say, you know, he, stay away from this guy. He's going to steal somebody's job. I went and sat down next to him on the bench I said, hey, man, it's going to be okay. You know that, right? And he looked like that proverbial deer in headlights. And he became the starting shortstop as a freshman. I was the second baseman. Hmm. And I think by law, you have to be close with your middle infield partner. But by choice, I kind of remember things my mom would say about like, you know, if it's, it's as old as time. If, if everybody's jumping off the Brooklyn Bridge, would you? Well, that's more than just a fairy tale. That's, that's, that's a real lifestyle. And, and I think... You know, when I think back to it, I was doing that then, right? I was, it was actually a little bit courageous in my own way to go over to Kevin and say, you have some talent. Here's what you need to do to be successful here. Consider this. And we struck up a friendship. That's, a, that's amazing because I was kind of the, the opposite in, in that sense. I probably would not – I had experiences of upperclassmen just being jerks to me. And then when I was that upperclassman who had a chance probably – to lift up, but I, I, uh, well, you know, maybe, maybe it would have been different if the, it was a deer in headlights type kid. We had, when I was a senior, we had a freshman who was just like a, a an obnoxious ass. And yeah. so I, I was not about to go up to him and actually kind of reveled when he struggled and which goes to how poor my attitude was at times. Um, but that's just, um, that, that's really wonderful. Like what you were able to do. Uh, for a fellow teammate, but especially a, a, a middle infielder, because like the yeah, middle infielders, you're, you're conjoined twins in a lot of ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was a, I was a shortstop, and like a, it was a yeah. My second baseman's over the year. I always it was always nice when you had that that perfect chemistry. You knew exactly where to put the ball, and then yeah. just the way you were able to ham it up with each other. Yeah, and if you think about it, looking back, I mean, he had so much more skill than I did defensively. So it was like if I threw the ball anywhere near him, he would do things with it that I couldn't. <laughs> but I got to tell you, you know, he he looks back on that extremely fondly. He he often says it in interviews that I, I was influential. Well, let me tell you, he's paid it back tenfold. I mean, I'm I'm not sitting here talking to you if it wasn't for Kevin. And I, and I don't want to make that syrupy sweet, but it's true, right? He he uh, he and I started KWB uh, Radio. But he'll tell you that he started it so that I could get outside of my comfort zone. He thought I was good behind the mic, and he, he was really thoughtful about it. And then in so many ways that I could never cover on your show, he has been directly responsible for pushing me or pulling me into the 1% project. So it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Mm. You know, with, with the, you know, something of the nature of, of 1%, 1% better, what, what can sometimes become the – if there is a danger of always, you know, this sounds kind of weird, but like that a danger of always trying to Im improve and in a sense that, yeah, like you don't want to be static, but at the same time, like, is it possible to appreciate what you have now? If you're always trying to, you know, can you appreciate how, how it is now? If you're always trying to get better, can't like, can you be happy in the present? If you know, 
Like if you're always trying to improve, if that makes any sense. It, it makes a lot of sense. It's a very thoughtful question. And actually it calls to mind, like if we want to take it to a dark place, you could see a satire where it would be like, nope, I'm going to be good today. I don't need that extra 1%. You could just see some kind of like internet meme where it's like, no, no, I'm, I'm going to get 1% worse today on purpose. And uh, so I, I know that's not the spirit of your question. The spirit of your question, in my opinion, is one of Seth Godin's uh, famous, well, I don't know how famous it is, but it's unbelievable. He says good enough can mean good enough. Mm. So I love that. And I, and I think when I think of what Seth meant there, there's a, a place for segmenting it. So if you say to me, is it okay to not learn anything today or get 1% better? I say an emphatic no, it's not okay. If you say to me, is it okay to not try to perfect this piece of writing any further and publish it? I say, hell yes. That's how I look at it. You know, um, art is never finished. It's only abandoned. I can quote you all day. There comes a point where we need to ship. There comes a point where we have to. Now, let me rephrase the last part. I was going to say that it comes a point where we have to be happy with ourselves. That part is, is daily. That part is part of your lifestyle. Comfortable in your own skin is, is a journey. There's no doubt about it. But good enough is good enough. So to your question, yes, you can't continue to put pressure on yourself. I just really prefer to take a lifestyle where I need to learn something new today, not because of some you know, arcane title, but just because it's, it's fun and it helps. Yeah, I guess I, maybe the, the, the spirit of the question is, is uh, it comes from perfectionism and how crippling that could be. Like maybe if I dis, all right, if I made this just a little bit better, I will ship it tomorrow. And then it, it gets to that point, like oh, just a little bit better, and then I'll ship. I, I have a, a yes. friend right now I work with, and uh, she wants to you know start her start a blog, and and she's like, oh, but no one's no one's gonna read it. And then she's like, oh, I've written a couple posts, but I haven't, you know, I have them in a word document. I'm like, just just publish it, just ship it. Yeah, and that's just, hiding. That's yeah, hiding. Exactly. I, I use those exact words, Joe. I was just like, yeah, right now you're hiding. And I said, Jamie, you know what the great thing is? No one's going to read it right now. <laughs> like, nobody is going to care. And so and then you say, well, what's the point, Brendan? What's the point? If no one's going to read it and nobody's going to. No, no. It's, it's a delicate balance. Seth Godin, I had a chance to see him in, in December, and he said that exact phrase perfectionism is a form of hiding. And, uh, you know, that's not at all the spirit of 1% because we can always make something 1% better. Um, but, but you're absolutely right. And if we, we take nothing away from this conversation other than that, it's this conversation is not going to be perfect. My next podcast isn't going to be perfect. Your next article is not going to be perfect. Your next story. Um, we need to be, we need to be shipping a lot more than worrying about those details. Which gets to a point I, you, you've 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 been cultivating this the, this one percent ideal for for a while, but it wasn't until July first that you that you that you published your your first one with Ryan Hawk, and then subsequently a couple of days after the the cold brew episode, which was wonderful. Oh, and, thanks. And uh, and ev- everything's been been great so far. So what what was the thought process as you were getting? getting this podcast ready off the ground and then finally you know when did you decide to hit publish and and just start rolling with it well i'm going to work backwards in that story and and again harken back to kevin uh in my parents kitchen uh over the right combination of beverages and food um he said so how's july 1st looking and i think i was hoping he had forgotten that i had said that Somewhere in, in, in a few of the places that I that had, was lucky enough to speak, I, I said, oh, I'm going to launch my project July 1st. Well, now it's, I think, June 29th. He's at my kitchen table and he goes, how's July 1st looking? And my answer was exactly what your friend would say about her blog. Oh, it's not ready. He looked right into my eyes and in, onto my soul and he said, July 1st. And I said, no, but you don't understand. It's not ready to go out. Like there is a zero percent. I don't. And I started listing things, Brendan. I don't have an account. I didn't do this. I don't know if you need. I mean, some of it was nonsense and some of it was very real. And he said, July 1st. And I go, but I can't. And he's like, whoa, whoa, hold on. If you don't do it July 1st, what are you going to do it July 4th? July 4th becomes July 15th and so on down the line. He leaves the next morning I wake up. And it's like the Tasmanian devil 
uh, memory. I don't, e- Brendan. I don't even know what I did. I did some combination <laughs> of put my credit card into the computer to buy a Libsyn account. I did some combination of put things on my blog. I, I found out what an RSS feed was again, even though I did it. I did it for forty-five episodes of KWB Radio. I did so many things. I, it was like studying for a test the night before. No memory of what I did. All I know is that I had an episode out on July first. And guess what? It wasn't perfect. And guess what? If I listen to the intro again, I want to tweak something about it. And the encouragement that I got from Kevin and others outweighed the fear so vastly that it's almost like, wait, why didn't I say June 1st? Hmm. But I I did pick July 1st with a little bit of my personality in mind, which was it's summer. I'm a teacher. I'm going to have some white space to dedicate to this. Um, So that's the 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 end line of that story. Um, and, and it's a story of it's never going to be ready. You're never going to be ready to have kids. You're never going to be ready to try to search for a new job. You're never going to be ready to launch a new podcast. But at some point, you got to leap. And, uh, you know, when when the student is ready, the teacher appears and, and, and he was there. So what were what are some expectations and goals you have for the podcast? As you, you know, sometimes you know you just we, like Godin says, yeah, I would blog if no one was reading. I would still do it every single day. You know, it just so happens people love it. But yeah, you know, if nobody read it tomorrow, I would still blog. So mm-hmm. um, you know, so what are similarly in that vein? Like, what are your your goals for for your podcast and so forth? You know, I recently read that uh, there's a lot of myths surrounding learning styles, according to some some doctors or cognitive scientists, and I, I don't I don't believe that. I don't I don't believe that. I know there's data to try to that tries to prove it, et cetera, et cetera. What I mean by that, and, and I'm not to, here to debate that, I'm a person who learns an unbelievable amount by talking things out. As soon as this conversation is over, I'm grabbing a notebook and I'm going to write notes on what we talked about, how I can improve next time in terms of being more clear and what I learned from you. And 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 hopefully when people reach out, um, then I'll include them in my process. So That is to say, if I can have an amazing learning opportunity uh, just on a one-on-one in-person basis, how much learning can I do if I reach out to two types of people, world-class leaders in the field and, and I never thought I would say this in a million years, something similar to Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Who are the people in your damn neighborhood? Hmm. I mean, why can I not learn from the guy who owns his hardware store down the street from me, who is running that hardware store better than any hardware store I've ever been in. How can I have the audacity to say that I can't learn from him? So my project's going to have me in front of people that I can learn from people like you who are out there in the world doing it publicly, and I can learn from Rick the wine guy. I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer. And just getting myself in front of a microphone is a lot easier for me and how my brain works than writing it down. Now I'll do some writing, but the art and science of conversation and interviewing is just intoxicating. To to that point there that like right in your backyard are world class experts, but you know, maybe because they don't have the shiny veneer of, you know, the the big millions of followers online and that kind of highlight reel, you almost dismiss it. I, uh, you're a hundred. Yeah, you're a hundred percent right. You said that so much better than me. Rick is world class. You know, Adam is world class. He just doesn't have a blog. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and when I was you know speaking, when I speak with a lot of writers like Glenn Stout, who's uh, you know the series editor of Best yeah, American Sports. Sports Writing, and um, he and I were you know he lives way up in northern Vermont, and you know he's not around anything. And and uh, a magazine I write for and. Well, you know, this little itty bitty town, but there's narrative everywhere. Like there's back. You don't have to go to the Iditarod to write like a really good story. Like there's a lot of backyard narrative that you can just tease out from right where you are. And then maybe someday you'll get lucky and be able to travel far for a cool story. But there. Yeah. Exactly. Like it, the, there's so much wealth that you can cherry pick, you know, with a bike, you know, your bike ride away. It's great what you're saying. A hundred percent. I've had so many titles for, for whatever podcast I eventually launched in my head and they all peek their head into this. Right. I, so, 
you know, at one point I was thinking about the idea of unfamous people, you know, a grammatic error, gra- grammatical error on purpose, because who are we to say that someone that's famous knows someone more? So we know that. But at the same point, l- l- the people that are quote unquote famous or have more of a reach are worth talking to as well. I'm not going to reverse discriminate against them. I want to hear what additional steps they took or what additional lucky breaks breaks they got that took them there. So a hundred percent. I'm, I'm interested. You know how a lot of people are why people, you know, that's, that's a big, uh, kind of trope. Why find your why Kevin's a big why guy. I'm a how guy. Uh, I'm a, I'm a what and how guy. So it's like, okay, what is cold brew and how the heck do you make it? Well, you and I are sipping cold brew mm-hmm. while we talk and it's an incredible thing that makes life a little better. Um, and someone could turn around and go, well, I, I really, I like my regular coffee. That's fine. Cold brew episodes, not for you. Um, I'll do one coming up where it's 1% better somatic yoga. Brendan, I didn't know what somatic yoga was two weeks ago. <laughs> like, how is that not fun? It might not be fun for you, but I'm tuning in to say like, okay, I don't know what the word somatic means. So let's check it out and see what's going on. So I'm doing two things, long form conversations, but I, I love, and I, it takes confidence that I've had to develop as a muscle. I love the idea that I can write a master list of things I'm interested in. And I can do 1% better steak, like steakhouse food. And like nobody, and you know what? Get back to permission. Nobody can tell me I can't do it. And you have every right not to click on it. But the confidence that I have to do that is a muscle that's been exercised over time. And if I'm off air, I'm probably not as confident as I sound right now. <laughs> so as a, as a how guy, how do you set up your day so that you can look back on it and say, yes, I, I won Wednesday. I won Thursday. The answer to that is sporadically, irregularly, and not at all at a world-class level. You know, if I'm being candid. Um, just recently, I went back to the five-minute journal, okay? And I've had two or three incredible days. Now, is it because of that? Not necessarily, but it's rooting my day in something. OK, um, there's no doubt about it. But the the idea that I, I could sit here and, and kind of tell you and your listeners that I have a world class routine would be disingenuous. My routine during the school year is one thing. Uh, my routine in the summer is another. I'm doing some coaching. Um, th- the bottom line, though, is, y- you know, you and your listeners deserve something practical. So things like. Let's not check the email before I get out of bed. That has worked incredibly well recently. Yeah. Um, you know, something as funny as going to settings and hitting mail and just not having any alerts pop up. How ridiculously uh, basic is that? But it's freed me up so much. Um, I've been trying to drink good coffee. Um, I've been trying to exercise a little bit more. But, you know, I guess the answer to your question is the most important thing that's helped me specifically has been diet. You know, my wife has helped me with my diet so much to the point where I feel like a new person. And when people complain to me that they're not having a good day in a very non condescending way, I just say, Hey, how's your sleep and diet been recently? And it's almost always linked. Hmm. Um, but I, you know what your question really calls to mind, Brendan is the idea that that's a place where I really need to attack so that I can grow more. Hmm. Yeah, there's something to be said for I'm obsessed with morning routines and yeah, I've been obsessed with them for years and I'm still trying to dial to still trying to dial mine in in a way that I can put it on kind of like an autopilot and not have to think about it. I can just go be like a pilot, just hit the check boxes and yeah, we're going to hit a nice cruising altitude and no turbulence. You know what's funny? Uh you said it right. Um, I'm obsessed with them too. I love morning routines. Uh, people I read, they always say, well, it doesn't matter what your routine is as long as you have one. And then on the other side of my mouth, I don't have one, but I can give you a glimpse into this one. I live 45 minutes away from where I teach. So my morning is pretty, pretty fast and rapid in, uh, during the weekdays, but my first period starts at eight Oh three and I am the most awake teacher in the building. And my students are not ready for that. Right. 12th, 12th grade, why are you so excited? Because I woke up at six. You know, I mean, you guys, I'm, I'm in mid-season form. You live five minutes from the school. <laughs> so like just on a basic level, um, and you know what? This is a great time to mention this. Uh, we bought our house eight years ago, and eight years ago I started listening to podcasts. Hmm. I, I haven't had the radio on in my car in eight years. 
And it, it, it's, it's the idea, if you've never heard it before, of turning your car into a classroom. That can't help but spill over into my life. So I think that moving 45 minutes north of my school has made me a better teacher, a better learner, and has, is, the, is one of the main reasons why I do a podcast now. What would you consider books or documentaries and, and uh, that you watch or rewatch specifically? They're, they're ones that resonate so well with you that you go back to those books over and over again and those documentaries maybe, if you're a documentary watcher, like if you go back to those again and again. It's funny. Uh, in, in thinking about that question, uh, the rewatchers are the are the fictional pieces, the Goodfellas, Rudy, Swingers, Hoosiers, No Country for Old Men, Fargo, those kind of things. Um, documentaries, I, I don't know if I've ever rewatched a documentary. It's amazing. And, and, mm. and I'm looking, I'm saying, I want to give Brendan a good answer here. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't rewatch things. Um, I think I'm too much moving on to the next thing. But this is how I think about it. I quote documentaries, quote movies, quote books incessantly to the point where a lot of my students and people that I mentor will say, um, how do you remember all that? That's my rewatching, right? That's my thing. So, you know, in terms of documentaries, Jiro, you know, Jiro Dreams of Sushi is an all timer. Yeah. Um, there's a there's I don't know if we would quite call it a documentary, but the idea of uh, the staircase. Have you seen the staircase? <laughs> no. Oh, OK, well. If you've stayed tuned this long, The Staircase is a seven-part true story, I'll call it, um, that is just off the charts, okay? I'm not going to say anything more about it. Don't Google it. Find a way to get it. It's incredible, absolutely incredible. Um, but in terms of re-watching it and actually answering your question, I am only re-watching them in the sense that I share them with others. Mm. You know what documentaries I, I I've, re, I've rewatched uh, Jiro Dreams of Sushi probably six or seven times, and I, I watch uh, some uh, uh, Thirty for Thirty documentaries over and over again because those are like magazine stories to me, but in documentary form. Like I the Jimmy Connors one, the one that Brian Koppelman and David Levine did. I probably watched that four or five times, and on the fourth and fifth time, I had a notebook double spread out, just blocking out how they structured it and like it was just so it was so cool to see how they went from one scene to the next to the, to the next one and how they got super granular on one particular moment in history and that's like kind of my favorite kind of journalism is that type of narrative story if wow suits my taste and so i know you're interviewing me but i gotta get something i gotta get something here and, and ask you so what are you looking for when you rewatch it? Because I'm not, I haven't even been thinking about it like that. Um, I'm looking at how they transition between between scenes, uh, between themes and scenes too. Like whether they're talking about how uh, Jimmy Connors was like this countercultural tennis player coming up through the '70s, and like I was actually basically had every quote, every person that they had, I kind of had on a stopwatch too. I'm like, how long are they quoting these people? On, wow. And it was like eight to 12 seconds, by and large, like clockwork. And, and so then I was just seeing like, oh, how are they structuring this? And I timed the the big moment of that was the, I think, the round four match against Crickstein, which uh, this, uh, you know, up and comer, they were friends, blah, blah, blah. And they took about 15 to 18 minutes, I think, on that one section right in the middle of the movie. And um, that was kind of like the big crux of the whole thing. Wow. And, and so, and yeah, I was kind of timing the whole thing. Like, all right, how much time are they spending on this, 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 building this, going back to this, then forward? You know, if there was slow times in the tournament, they sort of dialed up some of the other narrative elements. And so anyway, I was just really breaking that down. Yeah, so, so you real you you must realize that you're in the one half of one percent of people in the world that would do that. <laughs> Wait, it's, I mean yeah. that is a compliment. Yeah. I mean, that, there's no question. You have to realize that, right? I, I yeah, and some yeah, and <laughs> I, I think, I but and I, I approach books a lot like that too. Like if a book really stands out to me, like the one, I, the probably the best book I've read in a long time is Liz Gilbert's uh, "The Last American Man." And wow. uh, and she wrote that book. Uh, this predated Eat, Pray, Love by five years, I think. Like she's 
you know, a magazine reporter for a long time, making her. And so before she was famous, she wrote this book, which ended up being a National Book Award finalist. And it's one of the the single best narrative nonfiction books I've ever read. It's such a great profile of one person, and she wow. and she is just incisively funny throughout the whole thing too. I mean, she's just whip smart and funny, and it's it's great. I I have I'm gonna I almost started rereading it right again. Well, when I finished it, but I had to put it down because as for the podcast, I have to read a lot of books, so I have to keep going forward a lot. And um, you know what? Yeah, you're you're making me think of so many things. This is first of all, I'm going to steal that move on a book, and I'm going to try to or a movie. I'm going to do that soon. So thank you for that. Um, but you know what you're making me think about, and this this proves my point from earlier about like talking it out makes me learn. Um, I have a lot to catch up on. My my youth was spent playing baseball and sports, not reading a lot, not watching movies critically, just watching for fun. Um, so I think part of me, if I'm being honest, feels the catch up game where I can't give a book. Uh, that much attention. I need to learn something else. I have to be more familiar with another author. I'm not saying that's totally healthy, but I think that's something that that I'm dealing with. Yeah, I, there there are those two schools of thought really. That there's so much out there that why waste time rereading, rewatching, and you can use the you can use the same the same information to defend the other side too. It's like. Because there's so much out there, you're never going to get to it all. So you might, if you see something that really, just really strikes a chord with you, why not spend more time with it? I read Gatsby every year, so like, why not just like I love that book. I get more out of it every time I read it. It's so tight and lean, and that's another book I kind of map out. All right, what's happening here? Why did he starts with this quote with his uh, advice his dad gave him, and then it. And so, you know, and you just start breaking it down. Be like, oh, that's how he did it. You know, this is why, you know, Hemingway starts Sun Also Rises talking about Robert Kahn. And he cut out the first whole chapter at Fitzgerald's behest or whatever wow. that chapter was before. And you just start really getting into the bones of things. And I'd almost rather do that than just keep trying to add another pile to the uh, though. I keep want to I always want to keep reading new stuff. I do want to sit back and reread the the masters and and you can learn so much from the from a lot of from a lot of those things contemporary or dead writers too wow i absolutely love that i love that and so like going going forward with with your uh, with your podcast and and a lot of the work the a lot of the work you're doing like where do you where do you want to take it where do you see it going and you know what ultimately do you want people to keep taking away from the wonderful work you're doing well, thank you. Uh, I, w- I want to keep interviewing interesting people and people I find interesting. And, and that list is almost endless. I can learn something from everybody. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, I am definitely not one of those people that is looking to leave the teaching world. I'm someone that's an and guy. I'm a, I want to be the best English teacher I can be this year. And I want to create things on, uh, on my own. Well, not on my own. I was going to say on the side, that doesn't feel right. Um, and, right? I want to teach and create. Um, so right now I'm obsessed with the idea of the interview. I'm obsessed with speaking to people and mentoring them. If anyone gets anything out of this, you know, like I said, um, I I would love to be someone that people think of as someone who can come and speak to a group. Um, I, in August, I'm, I'm going to be speaking to a group of coaches, um, for the cannonball foundation. I'm, I'm thrilled and honored that they thought of me. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, it's touching. It, it doesn't get old for me. There's there's not someone that's going to call me up and say, would you speak to this group? And me say, oh, are you kidding me? I mean, that's just the farthest thing, furthest thing from my mind. So if you say to me, you know, where do I want to go personally? And, and I want to help people, you know, as a resource. I would love to point people in the direction of how to optimize their time. Their, something as quote unquote mundane as a great cup of tea and something as profound as kind of a creative process. If I get to be seen as a, as a resource because of who I've come in contact with, that would be phenomenal. Um, another part of it is kind of what, what I see in, in you know, a, 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 an up and coming podcaster, Patrick O'Shaughnessy recently said the goal of his podcast was to have no goal, just to have great conversations and, and who knows where it leads. So, you know, Kevin and others remind me of that also. Um, I, I'm a how guy, as we, we talked about, I don't have a really clear destination in my mind of what the finish line looks like. I want to just continue to, to improve the podcast every episode, and I want to speak to more people. So if I could speak with people, if I could speak to people, if I could work with them, that's that's what would really, really fire me up um, as I go forward. 
Awesome. Well, with respect to your time, Joe, I could I could talk to you for another three hours and uh, and have a, have a great time doing it. But uh, in in respect to your time, I'll let you get out of here now. Like, th- thank you so much for for doing this and doing the work you do because uh, people are gonna are are only gonna start getting to know what it is you're doing now if they don't already. And uh, you're being a great contributor to to the world of creators and teachers and learners. So uh, just keep up the great work and um you know we'll be in touch down the road and thanks again for coming on the Creative Nonfiction podcast. Oh my god, it means so much that you reached out and I I, I want to continue this relationship and like you you said it best, if anyone gets something out of this conversation, it was it was time well spent and you have my number and I would love to be in touch. Fantastic, Joe. Thanks again and uh yeah. Yeah, just keep on doing we what you're doing, it. and we'll talk That's later. That's another episode My of the pleasure. Creative Nonfiction it. Podcast. There will be no joke this week about my wife not subscribing to the podcast. I know, I know. I will ask you to leave a review, though. <laughs> In exchange for not having to listen to a joke, I ask that you leave a review. It takes less than 60 seconds, but will help me forever. So share this with a friend. Keep challenging yourself and your work. May the road rise up to meet you. And may the riff always be at your back. See you next week. <laughs>